Yes, what is up, everybody? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 45. Uh, we're getting up there. Tonight is is going to be incredible. Um, I literally have one of the best runners on the planet joining me tonight. I, I'm honored to have her on the show. She's an incredible athlete, um, both on the road and on the trails, internationally and local. As you can tell, I'm not in my usual studio space. Uh, I'm in Vancouver and that's ironic because my guest is also in Vancouver, uh, so it's a Canadian-themed show tonight. Very excited to share my guest with you guys. Uh, it's Ellie Greenwood, and uh, we're going to get started here in just a second. Thank you for your patience as we worked out some tech issues. Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 45. Let's get this show started. <laughs> Ginger Runner. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is going to be awesome. Um, tonight I am joined by, like I said, one of the best runners on the planet. She's incredible. She's won countless races. Her her resume is a thousand pages long. Uh, a couple little highlights. She currently has the Western States record for females uh, in 16, yeah, 16 hours, 47 minutes, and 19 seconds, which is mind-blowing. This year alone, she not only won Comrades, she also won the IAU 100-kilometer World Championships. Uh, I am honored to have her on the show. Everyone who's watching live and listening in the podcast version, welcome Ellie Greenwood. Yeah! <laughs> welcome, Ellie. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Oh, of course, I love it. Uh, so we're both coming to you from from Vancouver. This is your home now, yes? It is, yes. Although I like to be a trail snob and say I live in North Vancouver, which is of course yes. far closer to the trails, right side of that bridge, so I don't have to commute. But uh, yeah, beautiful North Vancouver, BC. So. What, what is uh what is your original uh, country of origin? Because I, I sense the accent, obviously. Yeah, the accent kind of is a total mishmash, like uh, born in Scotland, don't really have a Scottish accent at all, uh, so definitely say I'm British, uh, grew up in the east of England, and uh, yeah, I've been over here for uh, kind of on and off for about 12 years, but I've been here kind of permanently for about seven, so. <laughs> and uh, you would consider this home? Uh, North Vancouver is home for you now, or do you? Yeah, do you no, totally. I mean, I um, I was very excited to get my Canadian citizenship this summer, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, that was very exciting. So I'm dual citizen, and yeah, I left the UK like right after university when I was 22. So I've never really worked in the UK, and so yeah, like if I went back there, it's not like there's one spot that I would go to. So definitely, like Canada is home for the foreseeable future. So. I mean, you you are really blessed up here too. Uh, in, the, in the few times that I've come up and run the North Shore Trails and the Vancouver Trails, they continually blow my mind every time I'm running them, both because they're physically demanding, they're incredibly difficult, but so beautiful and lush and technical. You really have a haven in the North uh, Vancouver area with, with trail running. Is that one reason that kind of drew you to that area, just because... Uh. Yeah. No, like I kind of took up running like once I moved here, but obviously there's such a running community that you easily get like dragged into it, and yeah. it's definitely one reason why like I, I I did have a little stint where I lived in Banff in Alberta for a few years, and right. I moved back here a few years ago, and like people see pictures of Banff and they're like, wow, if you're a mountain runner, this must be awesome. And they kind of see the photos in like August when there's like snow on the peaks, but not right. actually on the trails. So yeah, like definitely once I'd been in Vancouver, went to Alberta and kind of froze for quite a long time and ran on my own in the winter whilst everyone else skied. Um, it was kind of like yeah, Vancouver's uh, whether it's road running or trail running, mm -hmm. and yeah, like the, the awesome thing about North Van, like we get snow up on the mountains so yeah. we can go snowshoeing and cross-country skiing and obviously like Whistler is like not far up the road for downhill skiing so we can do all of that but then also like on the lower trails they can be pretty much like snow free or certainly runnable even like on a little bit of snow uh, throughout the year so that's nice. Yes, excellent. Um, and I definitely want to talk to you about this year in particular in your running career. Before we get to that let's let's kind of 
build up to it? Because I know some of my live viewers are familiar with uh, with your running uh, this year alone. I mean, you've, you've done some incredible things this year, but they might not be familiar with your origin. How did you get into running? I know it's it's you haven't been running your whole life, right? It's something that kind of came to you when you were uh, in Europe, working in Europe. Is that kind of the... It, it was kind of once I came over to Canada. Like, I, I'd always been... Um, like, I never did track and field or, like, competitive stuff. Um, but I kind of did, like, all sorts of sports at school at a not particularly competitive level, but just, like... Um, like I was pretty enthusiastic about whatever, if, even if the skill level wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'd done one half marathon when I was at university in the UK. Um, so like enjoyed that, and then I came over to Vancouver, and I was like, I think I was like 22, 23, and uh, yeah, like my work manager at the time was like, hey, we're running a half marathon next weekend. And I'm like, okay, I'll do that. And uh, so I did that, and then they were training for a marathon, so I was like, okay, why not? Sure, I'd do that. And so I definitely got into, like, the road running scene, but, like, totally, like, recreational. Like, my, my first half marathon was one hour, 59 minutes, and 57 mm -hmm. seconds. Right. Uh, so I, it wasn't like I started out with some amazing talent. And, uh, yeah, and then I'd always liked hiking, and I worked for a travel company for about 12 years until uh, this year. And so I used to go over to, I worked in Canada in the winter, and then I'd go over and work in Europe, like Switzerland or Norway, or but somewhere in the mountains in the summer as a tour guide. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd always loved hiking. So then it was like, once I'd got into running, then it sort of was natural to go, well, hey, I like hiking and I like the outdoors, so I'm going to start trail running. Um, so yeah, it was really, I mean, I did my first ultra, I think it was 2004, and that was here in Vancouver, like a super low-key, like 50k uh, sort of trail and road run. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of got into it from there, and then like, I, I even so, like I had quite a few years where it was, it, this is social, this is fun, and you know I'll, I'll do races, and yeah, I'll do my best, but I wasn't like super, I'd say like serious about it. Right, like full-on yeah. career, that that sort oh, of thing. No, no, no. Um, and it was sort of like 2008 when I started getting taken on board by Montreal Mountain Hardware that then I was, you know, and then I was doing well in local races and that kind of stuff. And yeah, so around about then I started, you know, going down, maybe doing like chucking up down in Washington. And yeah. of course, uh, like there's more competition once you start going to US races. I mean, nowadays there's some good competition at the Canadian races, um, but it's not as deep as in like if you go down to the US. So uh, right. yeah, so 2008, 2010 was when I started like, yeah, getting a few sponsors and doing better at races and just, and then traveling more and therefore getting to more competitive races. So. So one thing I actually um, admire about you, and there's, there's only a handful of athletes that are kind of doing this at, at this moment, you're able to kind of uh, do this transition from road to trail to road, ra you know, races of all distances, um, not just ultra length, but you're, you know, you're doing shorter distances, or I guess shorter distances compared <laughs> to ultras, uh, but, you're, but you're able to kind of bridge that, that divide between the two sports. Uh, there's there's a handful. Uh, Michael Wardian, Sage Canada, these guys are, are road specific or road speed guys, but they're doing incredibly well on the trails. And you're doing the same thing. And not only locally, but internationally. It, it, do you feel a draw to one or the other, like road or trail, or do you love being able to do both? Or kind of where's your your direction going? Um, no, definitely I want to carry on doing both of them. Um, like, and I don't think like they're not mutually exclusive I mean I would say I do better on trail races that are runnable trail races and I think that transfers from the fact that um, like I do enjoy road running which is pure all-out running <laughs> um, yeah. so and I, I like the balance right of um, I'm not saying I would get bored if I just say did trail racing um, but it's like well why do you need to narrow yourself down to just doing one? Um, like, there's definitely times in the season where I'll focus on, okay, I've got, a, like, a, a road race coming up, so I'll still be running on trails, but maybe, mm -hmm. like, for recovery runs or hitting, like, easier trails where I'm really running more than, say, like, hiking. 
Um, and then once I've sort of hammered myself and beaten myself up on the roads, I go, okay, yeah. now to time to like mix it up. So it's good for like um, you know just mixing things up. So hopefully like not getting injured. And and yeah, just the motivation as well of like mm -hmm. then once I've had a block of time of focusing more on the roads, I get onto the trails and I'm like super excited because there's routes that, yeah, I've been on a ton but maybe not for like six months and so it's all right, okay, back onto this kind of thing. Um, like I will totally say like I'm not going to be, I did um, speed go and the rut this summer yeah. which were so much fun so much not what I am good at. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Like, I don't want to, I was like, why, you know, if you pigeonhole yourself too much and go, I'm only going to do what I'm good at, then also mm -hmm. that can get a bit boring. Like, that's not really why anyone gets into running, is to do what they can do and what they know they can do. Like, you go in because you want to do stuff that you're like, oh, I'm not quite sure what this is going to be about, but I'll go and give it a shot. Um, but I have total respect that in having more of a like running focus in some parts of the year, I then can't like rock up at speed go and do super well because I've been running on flat stuff and suddenly I'm like having to like power hike up some like crazy scree, scree slope or something. So right, yeah. definitely. I mean, I, I want to actually start talking about. Uh, the rut and speed go uh, in this episode. I know that you brought those up, um, but we'll get to those in, in a second. I want to remind those of you who are watching live. It is it is live. Uh, I have my eye on the chat room during this entire thing. So if you guys have any questions for Ellie, go ahead and ask them. I've already pulled a couple aside from earlier before the show, uh, so I'll be asking Ellie those questions uh, before the end. We are on a bit of a, a tighter timeline tonight. YouTube apparently is, has decided to do some technical upgrades from 7 to 9 p.m. So we're going to try to wrap up before 7 p.m. so there's not going to be much of a post show. So if you have your questions for Ellie, get them in the chat room and I will uh, relay them as quickly as possible. We already have a couple comments that I'm that I'm drinking wine. Uh, Ellie, I don't know if you're familiar with the show, but I normally drink beer. Uh, I'm a big beer guy and for some reason tonight we have a bottle of open wine so I, I started to partake. Um, so I, I apologize to the people who are watching that I'm not holding beer. Uh, I'm classing it up because I wanted to impress Ellie. Let's as, be as long as you're drinking BC wine and as, no, it is. Californian imports, then we're all right. Yeah, none of that stuff. All local. There's, there's so much good local stuff. Anything I can do to support the local economy. Uh, yeah, people were talking in the chat room about recovery. So for you, uh, we just talked about road versus trail. Does Are you able to recover quicker in, in, in either of those sports? Like uh, after you finish a road race, is it does it take time for your body to recover uh, longer than like a trail race? Yeah, for sure. Like, um, particularly if you start doing road ultras, right? Like, oh, yeah. the distance and like how hard the surface is. Um, like, obviously, if I'm training for a road ultra, then I will train a chunk on the road. And part of that is that you just need to get your muscles used to the pounding. Um, right. But as anyone knows, you then go and run harder and faster on race day, and so than you would, and that's relevant whether it's road or trail. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, in a sense, however hilly a road ultra might be, like Comrades, it's still pretty flat compared to a trail ultra um, right. on, on average. Um, so you get the pounding of the tarmac, whereas on the trails, I mean, like, it was kind of funny yesterday, I went out for, like, this super low-key run with friends, but then I realized afterwards that I haven't really done much, like, uh, climbing or descending on the trails recently, so I'm feeling really beat up today. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's what you train for, um, but definitely from the trail races, you recover quicker. I think partly, I mean, it's partly the surface, right? Like, it's, it's just softer. Um, and also likely because of the terrain, you might well be going slower, you might be having hiking breaks, whereas even like on a road ultra, you really like, if you're trying to really like compete up at the front, you're running the whole time. So it's just that con much more constant motion, you're not like using different muscles. Um, so yeah, I'm still feeling a little beat up from World 100K, which was over three weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, so both the 100K and Comrades are road races. They're road ultras, very, very long distances on hard surfaces. With, uh, for, let's just talk about Comrades because this is, this is one of those events that it, it's global. Uh, it, it has people from around the world that run it. It is a huge emotional 
um, race for a lot of people. It's a lot of people's first ultra or only ultra that they'll run on any given year. Um, I've only watched it, the live stream, and this, this last year I was glued to my computer screen at 4 in the morning or whatever the time difference was watching your performance. Uh, so this race came alive in the last 10K. Um, for those who might be not uh, might not be familiar with comrades, can you just quickly explain the race? But then also, what happened in the last 10k? It was, I mean, it was emotional and incredible. How do you feel? How do you feel after a performance like that? Yeah. So you know, comrades is an absolutely amazing event, and I always say to trail like ultra runners, like if you can kind of convince yourself to do one road race, comrades is absolutely amazing. Um, like this year it was the 89th year um, so it's been held every year since I think 1922 or so except during the war um, and the reason it's called Comrades is because um, a group of guys the first year there was only about 10 of them wanted to celebrate their comrades who had died in World War One. So they wanted to create something that was really physically challenging. So I don't know how they came up with this, but it's a point-to-point -point route um, that switches direction between the cities of Durban and Peter Maritzburg. So one year it's an uphill run, net uphill, another year it's net downhill. Right. Um, so obviously going for these like 89 years, like there's there's so much history behind it. Like there's people that have run it like. 30 something times um, or if not more um, you know there's still like legends like Bruce Fordyce who was like setting course records and stuff back in the 80s like he runs still runs it most years um, and now it's gone from you know a couple of these like war veterans running it in the 1920s to um, 18,000 people every year um, running it so and obviously being That's on incredible a road there's supporters all the long way so it's not like I mean and each to the right but you know it's not like a trail race where you sort of disappear off into the trail it's like you're running through um, there's quite a lot of like small towns along the way and like everyone will come out and like have their barbecues going and they're drinking beer and they're cheering all the runners on um, it's got 12 hour time limit and most of the runners come in between 11 and 12 hours so it's very much like mass participation um, but equally there's like super fast guys and you know women up at the front right. um, and yeah it's just you know like the whole atmosphere around it is very cool um, and like you said like the number of South Africans that do it that like so I've only ever done one marathon and they have to do that to qualify for comrades and you're like okay this is 89 kilometers it's quite a long way it so yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> it's a really um, yeah huge event with all sorts of stories and then you get different colors or names of medals depending like if you finish under seven hours or eight hours or nine hours so even people that are sort of more middle of the pack are really racing it because they're like oh I want to try and get you know some kind of better medal by running faster um, so yeah, it's, it's very awesome and there's real like good spirits between all the runners and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, so this year was my third time running it. Um, so I run an up year and a down year. Um, so two years ago I ran the down year and came second. Um, but I was in kind of like joint lead for about 20 kilometers. Um, and then by the end I was... I, I'd lost quite a bit of ground, but then I got it back to the. I was only like 72 seconds behind first place. Unbelievable. Uh, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, it was kind of. I mean, it wasn't really frustrating because I had like an absolutely like amazing race, and I put myself into the competition and ran really hard, and so I was like, look, you know, like it wasn't like I trailed behind, it was like, okay, I, I really, you know, I was up there and I went for it and it didn't quite pan out. But obviously, you know, there was a bit of a like, mm, can I make up 72 seconds? Um, and the the woman who won that year was Elena Nergaleva, and yep. her and her twin sister, Alessia, Russian twins, have won it for nine out of the past ten years. Yeah, they have a they have a legend at at comrades being uh, the victors for multiple years. The Russian twins, 
yeah. going into this season or this last year, uh, that's when I started doing all the research around the race because I knew that you were going back to race and I really wanted to follow it closely. And just reading up on this, it was like it was always a competition between you and the twins, you know, for the last few years. And so I was I was really anxious. I can't imagine what it was like to yeah. be there. Yeah, I mean, it's um, they just have a huge amount of experience. Like they they know how to run that race because they've run it so many times, and when it is such a like competitive race like I think you have to be quite tactics of how you're going to race it and obviously because it's a, a hilly course you need to know right okay like how hard you go on the downhills but you don't want to go too hard too soon because it's 2,000 meters of downhill on tarmac so you could totally like fry your quads and then you know not quite be at the finish line yet Right. So, yeah, so anyway, I went into this year and, you know, I was coming back from injury, so it was like training has not gone perfect, but you know what, I'm at the start line, I'll give it a shot, I'll, I'll just, you know, not totally just go for it, but I think I can be at least up there, right, and, and this was the real focus of what, where I really wanted to do well, so even if I wasn't going to win, I was going to do as best as I could do on the day. Um, yeah, and all in all, it was a pretty rough day for quite a lot of it. Um, what people might not know is I actually ran 10 minutes slower this year than I did two years ago. Right. Um, which kind of goes to show that, yeah, it was, you know, I was having a rough time of it. it just one of those days, right? Like, everyone has them, and you're like, this is my A race, and I've trained, and I've tapered, and my legs are kind of not feeling it, right? And mm -hmm. So that was pretty hard because... You know, obviously, it was one where I wanted to do really well, and it was like, okay, this is the the main race of the year, and if I if I don't do well today, then no, I'm not saying that's it, but you know, like kind of a, a an, an opportunity is gone. Um, I know the downhill is like my stronger suit, so it was like, well, if I don't do well this year. I'm not saying I won't do well in an up year, but it's another two years until it'll be a down year again. Right. So, yeah, I, I struggled my way through, but I kept on moving and, you know, kept on going. And, um, yeah, I was like, you know, I'll just run this in and almost like I'll try to run as fast as I can to get this over and done with. Um, and, yeah, I had, I, I knew I'd, you know, pick things up, like, towards the end, like, maybe the last, sort of, 10 miles or so. It was like, right. okay, I can I can do 10 miles. Let's get this done. Um, but even so, I was totally shocked when, at about four kilometers to go, I saw both of the twins ahead of me. Like, I had... Did you know the splits at that point? Like, did you know the gaps? No, no. Like, people online could see the gaps, but I couldn't. So no, um, the crowd was had, saying anything. That's, that's incredible. The crowd was starting to say stuff, like, the twins are looking rough, and, you know, like, you can catch them and whatever, but I was equally like, well, I'm not exactly feeling great. Right, and they were exactly. The twins are walking, but I was like, well, I was walking five minutes ago, so maybe they're back running now because I'm back running now and all this kind of stuff. Okay. So I was getting kind of positive feedback, Um but even so, like I said, I just, you know, it was a bit of a straight road up ahead and it was going slightly uphill and I was just like, uh, okay, there they are. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, at that point, like I said, it, I think it was about three kilometers and before the finish line that I passed them and I passed them both in fairly quick succession. Oh. And I just thought, I've got to run for it. Like, this might be absolutely the only chance I've got to win comrades and I really really want to win comrades uh -huh. and I've been through a lot of you know coming second and then the next year having the stress fracture and not being able to go and then not having perfect training and this is it and you've just got to like go for it but not go for it too much because you might cramp like I was in a pretty rough state <laughs> at this point. I mean even um, with that few kilometers left you were still still trying to hold just enough uh to keep from totally bonking. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I knew I had to, like Alessia, um, when I passed her, I thought, I don't think she's coming with me. Mm -hmm. Elena, who has won more frequently, I thought, I don't think she is, but I don't know. Because I might have surprised her by coming up, and by surprising her, she now knows I'm ahead of her, and maybe she can get a second wind. So, no, it was literally like I didn't dare, like I ended up drawing quite ahead, and like, 
winning by five minutes, Got but it. I had no idea of this, and I didn't even dare like waste the time in looking backwards to see if I could see anyone. Um, so it was just like I'll run as hard as I can um, because if they're chasing me, I, I'm not the best sprinter like most ultra runners, and I thought I don't want this to come down to a sprint finish. So, but it was definitely one of those races. Like literally, until I was probably like within meters of the finish line, I wasn't going to believe that I had won it. So, yeah, I mean, it was pretty that, cool. That's unbelievable. Uh, I mean, people around the globe. I'm following in my bed at you know 4:35 in the morning just freaking out because we don't know what's going on live we're just following two dots or you know three dots along this tiny little course and trying to figure out wait did Ellie pass the twins <laughs> and sure enough you did Ellie walks away with the victory at comrades this year which i i honestly i bow down to you it was an incredible performance uh, incredible performance to follow from afar i can't imagine what it was like to actually be a part of um what what was your what was your mood like? I mean, f basically following that race and for that for the weeks following that. I mean, were you on cloud nine or were you already freaking out about next year and wanting to go back and do well or like, how does that work? Uh, no, I definitely was on cloud nine for sure. Um, like I say, it was a real one that I was like, I was almost like I could win lots of other races. Mm -hmm. in the ultra world, but if I didn't win Comrades and I'd been so close in 2012, I would have thought, mm, like, what if? That's the kind of, like, one missing thing. So, um, yeah, it was very cool. I mean, like, and another neat little thing about 800 metres before the finish line, I passed Ian Charman, who was out, he was just That's out, right. like, jogging along, right, you know, because he had Western States in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really neat to like have him there, and then um, a, a friend from Vancouver was there for Canadian Running Magazine, and I remember, you know, like you finish in this huge stadium, and there's people all up at, like in the bleachers, and there's this like, so you sort of get to the finish line, you're like, oh, uh, what do I do, right? Because it's not like you know an ultra race where, you, oh, I know lots of people here, so you're kind of like, oh, okay, what just happened? And so it was really neat to sort of turn around and see my friend Frank up in the sides of like, you know, a familiar face from Vancouver, which was really neat. And uh, yeah, no, then I was, yeah, I was in cloud nine for quite a little while. And uh, yeah, I will, I'll go back next year. And I guess, well, it's not feeling like pressure yet. Maybe there is a bit of pressure, but equally, I'm very much like each race is its own race and I'll do as well as I can do. And just because I won this year doesn't mean to say I'll win next year. Would right. I really like to win again? Yeah, of course I would. Um, but it's definitely not one like that you take for granted. Um, and yeah, like definitely compared to say doing the trail ultras in North America where you tend to know most of the competition. Exactly. Um, like you turn up there and I mean now there's quite a few familiar faces of be they South Africans, Russians, um, there's a couple of Brits, um, there are North Americans that go. So I do know some of the competition but equally it's a race where someone can pop up and you're like who are they and you're running right next to them. Um, so it's kind of good to have that because it keeps you on your toes if you do go back. So yeah. Yeah, how long did it take you to recover from that race? Because you had you had the IAU uh, World Championships coming up soon after, uh, like a couple months. I mean, did you take a long break? Um, I took, um, I think, like quite a little break, but I didn't feel like too, too bad. I think in part because of it is undulating. I mean, although it is net downhill, I've done like specific downhill workouts, like mm -hmm. literally like... I'm going to prepare to trash my quads and do that. Um, so yeah, and then in the summer I switched right over to, um, well then I think my next race was Speed Goat, I did Squamish 50 and then I did the Rut. So I had like a nice summer of um, it's not so much, like I didn't need to get my real running speed back. It was more like, okay now I'm going into races that they're on softer surfaces so I could get out on the trails. I could do more hiking and that kind of stuff. So I think that really helped me like recover in terms of uh, yeah doing that kind of stuff before then. Um, like the hundred k was like comrades was start of June and well the hundred k wasn't until November. So right. I had 
summer, some are on the trails of, yeah, let's not beat myself up on the roads even more. Um, and then once I'd done the trails in the summer, I was like, okay, now it's time to get a bit more real running speed back um, for a couple of months to target the 100K road race. So, yeah. So let's talk about those sky running races and, and Speed Goat and the rut and even Squamish 50K, which you dominated. Um, for the rut, I've only heard legends of the rut. I know it's only been a, a couple years running now, but this last season seemed to be the one that everyone's talking about because they started incorporating some real technical stuff, almost via Ferrata style, and I've, hear, I've heard next year is going to be even more intense. Uh, what makes that race not so much your cup of tea? Because I know that training in North Van, it's technical. It's some of the most technical stuff that I've run. Um, you're not dealing with altitude or anything like that, but what 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 made the rut different, or what makes Speed Goat different for you and, and a real challenge for you? It's just not what I like. I love it, and I love that kind of terrain, but I'm just not exceptionally good at it. Um, <laughs> like, so. Um, Look, it was interesting because at the speed go and and the rut, my times were within like I think it was literally about three minutes of each other. Oh no way! Um, wow. And the elevation is very similar. Although Mike Foot and Mike Wolf were delighted when I told them that in my Garmin data that the rut was had slightly more elevation um, <laughs> than speed go. That night they were like, "Awesome! This was what we were we were going for." Yeah. Um, the rut, speed go basically had one massive uphill, a massive downhill, another massive uphill, and back downhill again. Um, the rut was a different thing altogether because there was some pretty runnable terrain on there. Right. But then that meant, because there was some fairly runnable terrain, on the stuff that wasn't runnable, it was exceptionally unrunnable. Um, and I'm just not overly, like, experienced at going on, like, for example, there was, like, there was a rope section in one section, and these two women just, like, slipped down on their backsides, like, down this, and I was like, if you go, then you're, like, going down the mountainside. So I'm gingerly, like, holding onto this rope and going down backwards. So mm -hmm. I thought I could run downhill, but unfortunately some of these downhills were, like, sort of, like, dinner-sized pieces of, like, shale, and oh. you're, like, I was kind of skiing down them, but you can't really because they're so big that you're going to get your ankles bitten by them. Um, so it was stunning, um, but I'm just not, um, I'm not overly comfortable on that. Like, I, I like it, but I just slow right down because I don't know how to react on it. Um, definitely, like, the, the altitude, I think it got to me a little. Um, sure. But in all honesty, some of the uphill was so steep anyway that I don't know, like, I wouldn't have been running it anyway. Like, it was really, like, it, and it was not, it, it was definitely sky running, right? Like, it was yeah. not a trail. It was, you were on the side of a mountain where there's rocks and boulders, and, I mean, they tried to kind of clear a little bit of a trail, but basically you'd look up and you'd go, okay, next flag, I'll go to that, and then next flag, I'll go to that. Um, so it was so much fun. I can only recommend it, um, but it's one of those races where I often say, you know, you look at an elevation profile, that doesn't show the half of it. You need to know yeah. what that elevation is on and when it's on like loose, rubbly boulders, but so worth it for like the views and just the fun and like it's a mountain race for sure. So And w yeah. would you go back and do it again? Yeah, no, totally, totally. Like it was a lot of fun. Um, and like a great atmosphere, like at the finish line and everything. So it was definitely like a you know, a European style like you know, being in a ski resort and everyone's there and, you know, having the VK the day before, which I definitely right. decided not to do because I thought it would kill me. <laughs> um, but no, I definitely would go back. Um, and it's the sort of stuff I probably could train for here in North Van, but I just wasn't totally aware of quite how technical it was going to be. So, yeah. Now, uh, let's move on to just the most most recently becoming the world championship uh, or the world champion of the IAU 100 kilometer distance. What was that experience like? Um, because again, that race uh, was in a foreign country, so you're having to travel, you're having to, to acclimate to the time difference and stuff like that. You're running for uh, Team uh, Britain. Did you go into this 
wanting to win? Did you go into it with any expectations or was it more about the experience and, and the travel and kind of taking it all in and running with your peers and friends, people that you know, uh, or did you really want to want to win it? Because your performance um, was incredible. It was it was all of that combined, really. Um, like definitely, it's a total honor to be like selected to represent your country. Oh yeah. Um, and the really nice thing at the World 100K is like they have a, a team competition as well. So the placings of the top three, like men or, or women, like they have a team competition for men and a separate one for the women. Mm. Um, so there's real sort of like camaraderie of you want your teammates to do well, not just because they're your friends, but hey, we're all on a team together and so you know you're you're really hoping them they do well. And yeah, right. just the fact that, you know, you have to be selected. You can't just go, oh I'm going to go do this race. Right. It's, yeah, there is, will I get selected from my country? So that's definitely like a real privilege to do that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, there was definitely novelty factor about running in, you know, Doha in Qatar that was like, well, for another time am I going to be able to go and run in the Middle East? Like, right. this is going to be, you know, so it's, yeah, it's like, it's an opportunity that you get, well, I'm lucky enough to get with the running that I do of going to these places that I, probably wouldn't otherwise. So that was definitely an appeal. Um, and I did want, uh, I, I mean, say, did you want to win it? I don't think many <laughs> people would say, no, I didn't want to win it. Um, I, 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 of course, wanted to win it. I didn't expect to necessarily win it. Um, like, I knew there was a lot of other strong women there, like um, Joe Zakshevsky and Joe Meek on the British team were also both really good. Um, there was uh, Amy Sproston on the US team, uh, obviously Pam Smith, Megan Arbogast, Emily Harrison, Larissa mm -hmm. Dennis. Like it was a, the US had a really good team. Yeah. Um, uh, there was a couple of good Russians who were running, and then as we always say at World 100K, there's always some Japanese woman that you never see at any other race, but they right. have, tend to do really well. So it was definitely like, of course, I would like to win. I'm hope, I thought I would hopefully be in contention to win, but equally I thought I could have a really good race and come like sixth, and just because other people had better races. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was the added factor of, well, it's in the Middle East, so it's going to be a little warm probably. Um, so it, in all eventuality, I'll honestly say I don't think the heat really affected me hardly at all. Um, like the race was run at night time, um, so it was like low... 20 Celsius. I'm not quite sure what that is in Fahrenheit. Maybe like 65-ish. Yeah, it's about it's in the 60s, top upper 60s. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So it was warm, but not hot. Um, it was humid, which you know was maybe a bit of an issue with people getting upset stomachs and so on. But anyway, so that was going to be another added factor in there um, to sort of contend with. Like I said, on the day, I don't think it really affected. I mean, both Max's time and my time, and then were good winning times for a hundred k. Yeah, yeah so, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So I think people, obviously, some people I think suffered in the heat, but if you look at say the top ten women's times and the top ten male times, there are solid times for world hundred k that you would expect anywhere else. So I don't think the heat was. You know, certainly not as big an issue as it was. There was a 50k race uh, in the same location like three weeks before, and right. that like was a real issue there. So, that's yeah, that's interesting. I mean, do you get an opportunity to train in heat, being in in Vancouver where it's not terribly hot? Um, no, like it's not terribly hot here at all, right? Do you do sauna um, running, like sauna, you know, getting into a sauna, 130, 40 I did, I did sauna sitting, yeah. I didn't do any running. <laughs> um, I do think that uh, helped, for sure. Um, like, I did that for probably about two weeks before going out there. Um, and I was spending, like, up to an hour in the sauna and going in there, like, every day. So that definitely helped. Um, I did a couple of treadmill runs where I put, like, you know, like, a beanie on and a hoodie and gloves and like okay. your bath and everything and like totally overdressed. Did that help tons? I'm not sure. And of course, again, that it, well, it's not humid if you go to your local gym, right? Like it's right. conditioned. So <laughs> I, I, did, I did what I could with, I guess, sort of fairly average resources. But I do think uh, the the sauna, uh, like just sitting in the sauna, did help. So. Okay. 
So uh, at this point, I would actually like to ask a lot of questions from the live viewers. There's there's a whole list here, and I have some already pre-selected. Yeah. Um, they've been very talkative this whole time, and uh, I, I can't ignore them. And we're running a little bit short on time. I know that we have to turn and burn at about 7 p.m., so I'm going to kind of go through these rapid fire. Ellie, so yeah. whenever you're ready, let's just do it. All right, so this is from uh, Daniel Murphy. What's your 2015 race schedule looking like? Do you have anything picked out yet? Um, no, everybody's asking that. Um, yeah. Surprise, surprise, I'm going to go to Comrades. That's the only thing I've committed to. Um, I probably won't do anything big before then. Like, I'll do some build-up races. Um, I may well do Chuck and Up again, which I love to do every year. Hey, cool. And, uh, yeah, then after Comrades, I'm afraid I really don't know. So, yeah. TBD, to be determined. Yes. Uh, average guy asks, are you more concerned about running against your own times or those in a race against you? Um, it totally depends. Like a race like World 100K, I'll be all honest, I didn't really care too much what my time was. The definite Once I got into a position of being in the lead, it was, okay, I want to win this. Um, but yeah, time does make a difference. Like I like to get myself like I've now got like a pretty good time in a hundred k road rankings, um, and yeah, I do like to get good times in the rankings of yeah, say something like Western States. Even the first year when I ran it, like I think right. it was then like the second fastest time ever. Yeah, I like to stack myself up against history as much as the competition on the day. So. Uh, this is a personal question, Ellie. This is from Jeff Allen. Are you single? Am I single? Um, yes, I am. <laughs> you heard I it, Jeff. I don't know who that is. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't think this was like some dating website. Yeah, it's it's totally changed. Uh, this is now Who Wants to Date Ellie. Uh, okay. So let's go ahead and pick our contestants. They have to uh, like long distance running. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> and looking at the <laughs> Uh, CTAM79 asks, Ellie, what if any differences are there between racing in America versus racing in Europe or Canada, etc.? Um, I think like I've already said, and I no disrespect to Canadians because the trail scene is really getting going here in the ultra scene, but definitely there is more competition in the US for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. um, I think then going to Europe, where I've done stuff like CCC 100K, which I like to call this the, the mini UTMB, so it's in Chamonix as well, um, just the size of the fields, right? Like the issues with trail permits is less in Europe, so you're going to expect more people out there. But equally, there's more history to mountain endurance sports, so the atmosphere out there of just people that aren't even runners being out there cheering you on, I think you get uh, more in Europe. And I mean, I think that's growing in North America, but it will take some time for sure. Sure. This one's from Rob, and it's a, it's a great question for Ellie. Would you rather be attacked by one horse-sized duck or 50 duck-sized horses? Um, I'll go for the duck-sized horses. <laughs> <laughs> And do you know why? Because I've got size 10 feet, so maybe I can, like, trample them. There you go. Yeah, I thought about that logically. That's brilliant. <laughs> uh, and I actually have some questions that I actually pulled from earlier in the show uh, before we actually got started. Let's just pull those up here. This is from Barry S. Ellie, I see sometimes you're rocking the CEP compression socks or sleeves, and sometimes you don't. So I wanted to know what distinguishes if you wear compression or not. Um, I wear compression a lot, I would say, in recovery, even more than running. So definitely, like, after a race, I'm quite one, particularly, like, if you're traveling, and even if it's any distance at all, like sitting in a car or sitting in a, uh, on a plane, I always put my compression socks on. Um, I must admit, like, I love the compression socks for shorter distances, mm -hmm. but once you start getting something like 100 miles, I get a bit picky about what's actually, like, underneath your foot, and the breathability of compression socks is not as good. So sometimes that's why I might not wear uh, compression for some longer races. Yep. Got it. And this one also earlier from Dylan. Uh, previous stress fracture question, how do you cope currently moving forward with your training in terms of volume, intensity, and type of terrain you run on? Do you ever worry that it might flare back up? Now, you recovered from an incredible injury uh, a couple years ago. 
is that still something that's on your mind? I mean, does, does it still kind of weigh on you a little bit? Uh, yeah, for sure. Like, start of September, I started to worry I had another stress fracture um, oh, no. in exactly the same spot. So I'm very conscious of it. Um, and as well, it took me until I would say about October of this year, and I was diagnosed with the stress fracture in May of last year, it took me until of October of this year to get ba back up to some like really big volume weeks that I had mm. pre-stress fracture. So I do, and I, but I did learn from that, therefore, that I won comrades on less volume than I did before. So I'm less of a mileage junkie, particularly if I feel little niggles. I go, do you know what? You don't have to run a million miles. You can get quality runs in and get the same result. Um, I'm careful to mix things up, like even training for World 100K. I did a lot of training on a flat, like gravel trail. So very similar to road, but not as. And then I would, of course, do did some training on the road because otherwise the risk is you go into the race and you're totally not used to that. Um, but yeah, I'm very careful with that, and uh, you know, trying to figure out anything with like, was it my gait that figured that that caused the stress fracture? Working on things like that, yeah. and then just having a good team of a really good physio and a really good sports med doctor that hopefully like. I can see them and it prevents things before I get into like a real mess like I was before. Yeah, excellent. Uh, well, we're running low on time tonight, guys. Uh, Ellie, you're a fantastic guest. I, I, I could talk to you for hours. I would love to have you back on the program to talk about your training, your diet, like all of these things that contribute to you being one of the best runners in the world. I mean, not just female. You're obviously one of the best female runners, but you are one of the best runners on the planet. So it's an honor to have you on the show. So I'd love to get you back at, at some point in 2015 to, to talk in more detail. I know the viewers want to see the same thing. Where can people find you online? Because I know that you also post a lot of stuff. Where can people find you, whether it's uh, through blogs or Twitter or any of that kind of stuff? They can find my goodness, you've got me on the top of my head. Uh, so it's uh, my blog is elliegreenwood.blogspot.com. Um, that's nice and easy. Twitter is uh, ellijg. Um, made up before I realized people might want to find me. And on <laughs> Facebook, I believe um, that I um, facebook.com and what is it, backslash uh, Ultra Ellie, I think I am. I think it's Ultra, um, Ultra Ellie, yeah. Ellie. I'm pretty sure. And now I've lost you on my screen. So, yeah. There. Uh, so go follow her, everybody. Let her know that she's awesome for dropping by Ginger Runner Live. Um, and that, that's actually going to wrap up tonight's show. I appreciate you guys tuning in live. We'll get Ellie back on, and uh, you don't want to miss out. Next week, we have another Vancouver local. Gary Robbins will be on the show, and it's Gingermas. Because it's the week <laughs> of Christmas, I'll be giving away so much stuff next week, and I'll be joined by Gary Robbins, who has the most luscious ginger beard. It's going to be ginger overload, but it's going to be a merry Gingermas next week. We're going to be giving away prizes and stuff all week long, so follow all the Ginger Runner... Uh, social media stuff. On Twitter, it's at the Ginger Runner. Facebook, it's facebook.com slash the Ginger Runner. Gingerrunner.com. On Instagram, it's at Ethan Newberry. Uh, because all week long, global giveaways. And we're talking big stuff. So, so stay tuned for that. Again, thank you, Ellie. And uh, if you haven't already, go watch my latest film. I just posted it on Friday night at like 11 p.m. Altering Expectations. I followed uh, my fiance's first 50K Ultra, and it didn't go as planned. Uh, I'm really, really proud of this one. I hope you guys go check it out. Uh, it tells a pretty damn good story, and, and I hope you guys enjoy it. If you have already seen it, share it. Share it with your friends and family. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you're getting out there training hard, racing harder, and partying the hardest. We'll see you guys next week, Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, with Gary Robbins for Ginger Miss. Thanks again, Ellie Greenwood. That is Thanks it. So much. You got it. That's it for tonight's show. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs>